So I started this series um, around eight years ago and the, the kind of plan is, is that I want to try and introduce as many different composers to the organ as possible. Um, it's really tricky to get access to most organs as you know you can't take them home and they're actually in, in the, the churches or concert halls and you need to know someone with keys and so it's an instrument that perhaps is not being composed for as much as other instruments out there. And so the idea of this is that I offer the opportunity to postgraduate students to work with um, student organists in the creation of new works. Um, I've developed a partnership with Goldsmiths College over the year where I actually studied composition myself. And the idea came about because I thought it would be a really good opportunity for them to include an organ piece in their portfolio. Um, and also just start relationships between organists and composers in the hope that they will continue working together and you know the repertoire will continue to grow. So over the past two days, due to the last you know year and a half with COVID, um, usually we'll have students come in and they'll work on their pieces um, with the organ here. But because there there hasn't been able we haven't been able to open up the chapel. Um, They've all worked remotely, so most of our organists that we have have access to their own instruments. They're either organ scholars at a church or they've got a practice organ at home. And so um, they would have Zoom sessions where the composers would be working with the organists at their, their own instrument. And then they had um, about an hour today and yesterday to come in, pull the piece together and then perform it. Um, for us to film and record um, for an online concert. So it's kind of taken a bit of a different format this year, but I think lots of great things have come out of the fact that um, this forced them into a new way of working. Um, and yeah, it's just been fantastic to hear the results over these past few days. And I, I really hope that you all enjoy the concert.
Um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's called uh, 12 maps for Chalk Ridge. I think it was 11 maps at one point, but there's a, there's, there is another map in it, so it's, it's yeah, 12 maps. Um, it is, uh, it's a piece about, that was, uh, around that time I was thinking about, you know, where, where, does, um, where does music actually happen? Is it in the score? Is it in the performance? Is it in the mind of the listener? Um, and I, I suppose I was, th with some of the other music I was doing at the time, I was trying to make it that the score was some kind of an objectification of the whole music process that, you know, contains the piece within it in some kind of imminent way. And, uh, and I wanted to do, a, so I wanted to do a piece that kind of deconstructed that or challenged that, or, yeah, kind of criticised it in some way, because it's, you know, it's no, whenever you arrive at some kind of systematised idea, it's very good to, you know, in some ways, um, make fun of it or break it down or, you know, crack it open with a sledgehammer. So that's what this kind of piece is. This is like a, a kind of sledgehammer to that idea. And it was to say, you know, what point, um, to try and turn time's process back on the, or to turn time's arrow back on the compositional process. So that it started by, so I wrote a piece, um, uh, you know, like a, just a, a regular kind of contemporary music piece, and then gradually through stages tried to dissolve it. So uh, first by using, um, uh, well, I took first by using Sibelius to, to try and um, yeah, deconstruct it, like turn it into something irrational. And I thought that was, that, was, that was quite interesting for me to do because Sibelius and other kind of these very banal technologies that are so much, so, so much a part of music making life, we don't really think about, but it's always you know, the material basis of work that gives um, you know, the, 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 transcendent things, the transcendent, uh, trans, transcendent things that are happening, you know, these very like, dull, banal things that you do, like Sibelius. So, uh, you know, how much could you push that? Pr Even saying it now sounds really boring, doesn't it? You know, you say the word Sibelius and I feel like I'm going to fall asleep. You know what I mean? Um, it's like, uh, it's so boring. Um, but yeah, to see, instead of like, so that was, that was the tool of often with like, how, much, how could that piece be like, you know, dissolved and pulled apart and turned into graphics? Um, and then those pieces, the, the, so that, that turned into like 12, kind of 12 panels of these um, kind of irrational, See, now I'm going to try to do what you did on stage so beautifully, Catherine, which is to open it. Um, these kind of 12 panels of irrationalization um, that are like this. Um, let's see, uh, like this. That's kind of, um, which, was, which was then copied out by an artist, uh, Gina Valenza, um, to make it look as though they were uh, as a kind of like this kind of opposite of phantasmagoria. You know, because usually what we do is you know, we write music out by hand and then it's turned into a kind of notational document. This was the other way around of like, you know, produced in the computer backwards, it then into hand. And then um, with each one kind of these uh, different objects inscribed into them. So the idea of basically turning the score back into kind of deep, in one way, de-objectifying it, turning it into a process, which, you know, this is no longer like your kind of imminent object score. At the same time, kind of also turning it into physical, a physical thing rather than a document. You know, these are like it's, it's no longer like a. You know, you could kind of you feel you could almost eat like a baguette off that. You know, I mean, it's like a plate. You know what I mean? Um, and then they had within them stored these kind of other, other objects like a pen or a piece of notation paper or there were more interesting things like um, tarot cards and a picture of um, a picture of some hills. Um, which were also in the uh, briefcase, but I have lost them, so they were only pictures today. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the story of the uh, that's kind of the story of the score. At the end of it it, 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 it remains the point that there's almost no music in them at all. You know, everything that Catherine did today, which was so incredibly beautiful, I can't take any credit for it. You know, at the beginning you just you feel a bit like a racketeer. Catherine's making this incredible music that I could never write. I'm thinking, ah, oh, yeah, because I didn't. I just, you know. I've just, you know, drawn some, you know, uh, stuff on it, stuff on the thing. But the, the point of it is that at the end of it, that you arrive. Whereas in composition, you usually start with this moment of inspiration, where you kind of see the world a slightly different way, and then you try and objectify that into some kind of score that then contains that and can be released. This was the other way around. So start off with this, um, you know, object and deconstruct it all the way back until when you know Catherine's walking on stage there with the with the briefcase in this moment, it's almost kind of kind of ridiculous, like the moment of inspiration is, you know, everyone's seen that painting of the guy on the top of the mountain, like, looking like a, you know, like, looking like an idiot, kind of looks like, you know, someone w walking around with the briefcase, um, but it's that moment of, like, you know, that moment of inspiration on the edge of, 
nothingness where anything can happen. And that's, I suppose, what it was meant to be. So very, very, very easy for me um, to do. Very, very terrifying, I think, for, for Catherine, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, I needed quite a lot of reassurance from Alistair for it because it's something I've never done before and uh, yeah, it's slightly terrifying as he said, on the edge of a cliff and you kind of have no idea, um, but I kind of, I don't know, I guess it's been quite abstract, I kind of had a look at each of the panels um, and with the kind of outward theme of, you know, in the instructions it's like go take a walk on the South Downs. Um, and produce something, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, um, so I kind of had that in my head as a starting point, as like, oh, this is a warp. Um, and then, because obviously, well, this is the first time I've played this organ, so then I was like, well, I guess it's a bit of a walk through, a journey through exploring the organ, mm -hmm. which is something an organist does is that as the first thing they do when you, when you play an organ that you haven't done before. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the starting point, and then for each of the panels, I um, kind of had a look at the music. Of, of, well, yeah, as Alan, Alan, you may have been able to see, <laughs> um, they're really beautiful, um, and they're kind of art in themselves. Like you could, I, you know, I could put them up on my on my wall, and it would be <laughs> be quite um, quite uh, you know something. I feel like someone would comment on it every time as a piece of art. Um, and so I kind of tried to look at that behind it and then I guess just use my, my imagination and see kind of, so I, on various of the panels I thought, so on one of them I've, I've written tadpoles and frogs because <laughs> that just happens, oh there were some small kind of dots in the a thing, they just made me think of tadpoles for some reason but, and um, um, I was like, oh yeah I might come across them while I'm on my walk um, and I think for some of the others I have like tiptoeing um, like through caves and things. Um, I didn't actually use all of the panels in this because it was five minutes so it's um, quite long to kind of get through, not that very long to get through everything but um, yeah I guess kind of just without sitting down without the organ and kind of working out what I think each of the panels kind of says to me or means and then working just seeing seeing what happens from there <laughs> um, yeah and just trying to remove myself from any um, you know when you play classical music there are techniques and things for playing and this was completely there's there's nothing nothing that I um, have used before I guess it's just kind of you know using my fists at one point and um, yeah, I didn't. Alistair asked me to use my head, which I didn't actually. I whipped out of that, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just trying something new, I guess. I loved also how you two used a different aspect of the score for each piece. You used, sometimes you use the notes, but sometimes the kind of idea, like the ideas or mm -hmm. the thing that it implies. Yeah, so for one of them, there's a picture of a compass. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought, okay, well, let's. Oh, and he, um, Alistair kind of put. Um, that in kind of in the score with notes kind of in a circle and I was like oh well that would work really well because this has three manuals so I could kind of go round the manuals mm -hmm. visually I guess not just musically so mm -hmm. I kind of tried to do that um, yeah. yeah you can totally hear it as well yeah totally <laughs>
The general idea of uh, this piece was like um, trying to communicate light energy to my audience. So through the organ, I was thinking about uh, going into like loops um, as I was visualizing the, the sounds like as a circles and spirals. Uh, and that is how I see also like energy moving um, inside of us and in the daily life. And this also was like what is connected with my words, uh, whispering words um, through the mic, um, and also the electronics are going a bit like in these um, loops motions. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like this um, touch uh, energy from my point uh, of view to others. I think it was um, a bit challenging, but also in a way I think it was positive because um, we have shared like a few ideas before and once we arrive kind of like um, everything flow like in a, in a good way um, and we could understand well each other. Yeah, it's definitely more fluid working this way. There's no cost to me putting together a like software demo of the piece. There's no cost to me sending you, you know, um, pieces to listen to. Um, like the communication is much more constant. Whereas when you're expecting to have rehearsal time, you're kind of like, okay, we'll wait to discuss this until we're actually in the room. Um, which sometimes ends up just, you know, holding things up a little bit, to be honest. So, um, yeah, like loads of communication, um, lots more potential for ideas to fly around in like a shorter space of time. So yeah, it was it was much more intense. I hope so. I yeah. think it was a good start, um, and I hope we can work together um, in future projects. Andre's <laughs> writing for the organ is um, very different to how I'm used to playing. Um, <laughs> And that way of looping stuff, uh, it like doesn't appear in the traditional repertoire. Doesn't even really appear very much in contemporary repertoire outside a few composers who like to use loops. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to play more of that kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
well. So this is one of my first ever notating pieces. So it was very exciting to um, listen to MIDI for a long time, uh, for many hours every day. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, um, so I was just speaking to Anthony, I, the, the, the piece is called like Bouquet to Growers after this um, Ukrainian folk artist called Maria Primachenko, who I've just recently fallen in love with. And not her personally, like her work, I haven't met her. Um, and she just makes these like wonderful like sort of technicolor, really dazzling kind of 2D sort of monsters and things. And I, I guess I kind of wanted to make a piece that sounded like her art looked. <laughs> so that was the uh, that was the start. And then I got like um, listening to some uh, Ligeti stuff where he uses lots of these kind of really, really fast arpeggios and kind of thinking of ways of making arpeggios almost sound like chords when you put them all together. Um, and then I thought I would subject Anthony to an almost unplayable bass part. <laughs> but I wanted to make it sound like it was kind of falling to bits and then coming together again. Well, I think um, a couple of things. So I think, yeah, I guess from the challenger's perspective, I was um, quite worried that what I did make would be um, completely unplayable, or like I would, like I would just do silly things that, like, at the, you know, if we'd come together, Anthony could have said, "No, that's I can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> so when I did send it to him, I was like so, like, unbelievably relieved when he sent me back, like two or three things, that was it. And it was like, no, that's, I can't play that C, it's off the end of the scale. Okay, fine, I can change that. So that, that, was, like, that was like quite, yeah, that was um, a bit more of a challenge, I guess. Um, in terms of happy, like, I guess it forced me to sit down and learn how to use this scoring like, software. So that was quite, quite useful. Um, and we were sending stuff back and forth to each other a little bit, which was really nice, like ideas, and you sent me a few tracks. Yeah, um, yeah so, so, so maybe that wouldn't have happened otherwise, like we were emailing things back and forth. So yeah. Yeah, okay, I think, well, I've had about a, a week or so with the score, I think. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I've just sort of thought of it as a, as a really um, complex trio sonata, I think, and as a sort of technical exercise with then this more rubato and, and, and Gordon actually marks sw swimming in the notes in the final section, sort of much more, much more free and that kind of thing. And th there are some moments where I think I've been slightly approximate with the rhythm, I think, <laughs> to, just to put it that way with, you know, l l lots of quintuplets against, uh, you know, straight semiquavers <laughs> against triplets and all this sort of thing, but I just haven't quite got the mental brain power at the at <laughs> cross equals 135 or whatever it is. But no, it's been good fun. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that Gordon said that the idea is that it is chaotic and the house is falling apart, uh, kind of thing, and I'm very tempted just to sort of fall off the bench at the end of the piece. <laughs> and, um, but, but no, it's been really, really good fun. Well, I would love to. I would love to send Anthony more things. Yeah, to absolutely. Put his fingers on fire. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> That's um, it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've actually. Uh, well, I yeah, maybe should watch this space, but might be do might be doing some more composition work coming in the next few uh, months, which is very exciting potentially. So yeah, yeah, more stuff with notation software would be lovely. Yeah. No, actually, work. No, what I'm trying to say is. It's been so amazing having someone else play my tune. I've never had that before, ever. And it's, it's incredible just to, to be able to write something and then give it to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Your problem now. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, no, it's great. And I, I think I, I definitely need to push myself to play more sort of technically challenging things like that as well and, and really drill down into, into the maths of everything and, and find sort of creative ways to, uh, to deal with some of the uh, challenges. Definitely. I mean, mer mercifully, Gordon was very, very uh, sort of relaxed about um, interpretation and that kind of thing. I think what's really nice, both, both with this piece and with Jack's as well, um, is that you get some sort of really clear guidance as to what to do in terms of registration. Because there's so many options and um, these, these things are so generally sort of open-ended. Um, and both Jack and Gordon have had a pretty clear kind of vision as to what they wanted in terms of the sound worlds and everything like that. And in, especially in contemporary pieces, it's very easy to get lost in one idea that you get fixated on in your head or a piece which sounds a little bit like another one 
and you end up making lots of creative decisions based on some kind of preconceived idea. So actually having somebody there saying, you know, this is the kind of thing I'm after um, is, is a huge help. And then you know, I can say, this, this is what is possible, this is what isn't possible, and, and that kind of collaborative thing is a real, is a real joy.
piece is called Phlox's Ladder. The name came to me quite late, actually. I was, I was finishing up some of the details to it on the, the pink moon that was it, a couple of months ago. So, and it, or the Phlox moon, as it does, wise another. So I thought, and it's got this climbing motif uh, going through it. I was working with uh, Harmony using two different triad pairs to create these different colors climbing through and cycling between that. I basically just wanted to try and find some way of uh, creating a sustained texture that moves up and down and through the register of the organ and orchestra orchestrating a lot of those ideas. Anthony like, has, has uh, given a lot of ideas and input into how to uh, map that onto all the sonic options that we have on this organ, which has been really wonderful today. Yeah, I mean, first, the, the kind of sonic ideas that, uh, that we were after in this piece, very hard to do without actually hearing the organ itself and being in the building and having, what, about half an hour, 40 minutes to sort of decide on colours, decide on textures, to pull all that together. Um, but I think working sort of online, due to our great sort of geographical disparity as well, has meant that we've, I think we've engaged a lot more regularly than we would have done if we were only meeting in person. So uh, with both Jack and with Gordon as well, We've had a lot of sort of three-way um, discussions and input into each other's ideas and sharing a lot of recordings and other bits of music around, which I, I think we might not, have, might not have done otherwise if we were just sort of scheduled kind of physical meetings. Yeah, I totally agree. It's been really great. That, like right from the beginning, we were sharing ideas and pieces and sort of all finding different meeting points of ideas and, and getting some videos of, of, of uh, ideas that you've been trying out on, uh, in some organs that you've teaching on it, which has been really great through the process. But yeah, I think it, it's kind of, there was definitely a challenge in trying to conceive music for an instrument. I, I've never written a piece for the organ before, or I've ne never even touched an a, a organ in a chapel before in some way, so it, to, to conceive of what was possible on that was doubly challenging in some way, but I have to say it's been made so much easier by working with you and the way that you approached that. I'm quite amazed with what we managed to get done in this, in this time. That's a fantastic release. Definitely. Yeah, yeah it would be fantastic yeah, too. If you want to write a, a whole sort of oeuvre of, of organ works, then I'm <laughs> yeah, very happy to do some playing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's, I mean, it's, a great, it's been a really fantastic process. I feel so grateful for the opportunity. It's just really lovely to be here. And it's a fantastic instrument. Just the sound, there's so much potential. It'd be really, if the, there's the opportunity in the future at some point to, to really get to know it a bit better, or even after this experience, I feel like I know it a bit more when to approach it in that way. It'd be really fantastic.
the idea behind it, I wanted to explore the decay of the sound of the organ in the space. Um, the title has actually changed a few times, so I was going to say the title, and I'm like, actually, I think I changed it again, but, so I'll confirm that later. Um, so we were sort of looking at making spaces in between sort of musical phrases, <clears throat> and that uh, sort of the space in between being a, a sort of a psychological space, uh, geographical spaces, spaces between knowing and not knowing. I'm studying Arabic, so I was thinking, I was actually going to read the Arabic, um, which is by uh, a poet in Beirut. Um, and uh, I, was, I was like, I don't know enough to do this. Um, and I'm glad that he was reading it, Hashem, because um, his voice is so beautiful. And it worked really well, I think, with the space. So my space of knowing is, was too small for the Arabic, <laughs> I felt. But yeah, so that was sort of the main idea behind it. I guess one of the challenges, I think, was certainly notation. Um, and I mean, you can talk, you're, you're more qualified to talk about the the, the melody that we were using in that, but I think there was certainly a challenge um, as someone like me, as like a, a classically trained musician, to approach this music in a way that I can write it down and then play it. That uh, had its challenges, um, and I think obviously the, the recording quality over Zoom and things like that can cause a few issues, especially when we don't know what sounds we want here. Um, there's a bit of guesswork involved. Um, but I think the benefit was I, I'm sure we met more than maybe we would be able to hear, and it was more of an ongoing process rather than something that you know we pick up every two weeks or every three weeks here. Mm. I think that was definitely a positive. Yeah, I, I think we worked quite easily together, so we actually didn't have that many meetings. No, no, no. um, <clears throat> challenge for me was uh, not having written music. Um, you know, in a score, in the, I, I do open scores with pictures. <laughs> so to write this way was a real learning curve because I was using Sibelius for the first time while I was writing it. Um, thankfully I have some theory, so it wasn't too bad. Mm. But uh, Sam um, was very good at uh, taking out all that rest, little rest yeah. steps that Sibelius puts in. Um, yeah, I guess that if it had been in person, we probably would have sat down with the score and sort of hashed it out more. Um, but I, I like working in this sort of free way. That, and I work, well, most of the people I work with um, are in the Middle East, and so we work online all the time, and we do improv jams online all the time. So for me, it's sort of normal, and it, there's a, it's just a different way of working that you know, yeah, I don't. I can't put uh, my finger on exactly what would be different if it was in person. Apart from that, we probably would have worked more on the score, the musical part. But I quite like it. Um, slightly scary coming into it, um, but I think we managed to decide on some sort of some sounds to fill those spaces quite soon into our process um, which and sped up the process quite a lot um, and I think Joel you were quite useful from the start in what sounds you wanted you were very clear um, some some people who may not know the organ very well might sort of describe sounds using adjectives and things like that but I think from the start you sort of said I want a flute here which was <laughs> You know, very instructive is exactly what I needed. I think, yeah, the other thing I was going to say is if we had been able to come here once a week, that it would have been quite a different piece in that mm. being able to explore that decay a bit more. And, but it would have been probably a completely different piece.
Uh, yeah, so I think he's quite into the sort of techno music and so on from what he said to me, which is which is great because I'm like such a classical musician, you know, stuck to reading scores and so on. So it's great to think outside the box. Um, so he wanted to have a synth part um, alongside the organ, and um, as a result, the organ kind of played a uh, second fiddle to the synth part. Um, it's almost like two instruments, really. Um, and yeah, and we spoke quite a bit, uh, especially at the beginning, to, um, about what sounds he wanted from the organ, to not just to be the same as the synth part, but to sort of complement complement it. Um, so that, I think that was the process. And he just sort of, he kind of did it in one take and just sent it over, and that was great. Yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've done a little bit of experience um, at the academy where, where I study. Um, we're doing these sort of 200 pieces for the bicentenary. Um, so there's all these composers that are writing uh, all sorts of stuff. But it's kind of the first thing I've done, something with synthesizers, um, for example, which has been yeah, really interesting, actually. To, um, I guess it's almost like accompanying a choir, but a bit more interesting than that.
Yeah, um, so Four Call and Requiem was, was the piece, and he kind of, he sent me a lot of stuff to listen to, which is really helpful, and I could sort of try out loads of different sounds and send it to him, which I think, um, you know, now with COVID and so on, it's meant more stuff, more recording, more sort of um, communication, you know, uh, not face-to-face, -face, but that means that I'm doing more work and he's doing more work, and so I think as a positive, there's been more of a process to that rather than just the composer doing it and sending it over and then um, just having to do it. Um, so yeah, I think that answered that. Yeah, so, so he um, was inspired by uh, some lighthouses in, I think, near Yorkshire that were shutting down because they're, they're no longer used. And the Four Corn, which is meant to signal uh, ships coming into bay, um, there was this big concert that um, some Four Corns were played uh, to this great crowd. And there was, then there was an orchestra on a ship. It was, it was quite cool. Um, and so the piece was a sort of melancholic uh, throwback to, to those instruments, I guess. Um, and fortunately, I feel like the sounds are quite easy to replicate on the organ. Um, and as a result, the piece is kind of meant to uh, produce long, sort of long sounds um, which creates that sort of feeling, I don't know, sort of knot in throat type thing, um, where you're sort of missing, missing tradition, missing the past. Um, yeah, I think that's what, that was the aim. Um,
Um, so the piece was inspired pretty stringently from actually the video when we did our first Zoom meetup and we were shown the organ and I just thought, I actually did some reading around this building and the specific organ and how it came to be here which, because it's quite unusual to be asked to compose for a specific instrument, not just an organ, but a singular organ from a certain place. So I think reading around it and how it was put together and listening to some of the stop sounds, I'd sort of like decided on a, the flute sound is sort of the lead uh, voicing for it and just got a really poor VST um, <laughs> copy and tried to just write with the vibe of the building in mind really so um obviously being in the church it it's got slightly an overwhelming feel to the music I, I think i just wanted to have something with quite rich harmony which moved around um and i just kept it pretty much on two rhythmic themes it's very like simplistic in its approach uh, and it lets the sort of harmony and the organ just do the talking effectively Interesting, I suppose, isn't it? I suppose you know, with the uh, with Zoom, you have more availability, don't you, in theory? Um, yeah. It did. It did certainly limit, though. I think as well the the fact that it is, it is, you know, the organ is very dependent, I suppose, on on the instrument as well. So it's very hard to to say, oh, it sounds, you know, with certain stops, it sounds like a flute, but it's not a flute. There's, you know, something that an organist might say, oh, it's a metallic sound. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, I think it was the the first time as you say that you would compose for organ as well. So um, I think those are. Those were the, the only challenges, I suppose. Um, it's fortunate, I suppose, that I had an organ at home, so we were able yeah. to experiment with some of the sounds to go, it'll probably sound like this. Um, but I think that's the, the weird and wonderful thing about writing for an organ is, is you know, no two organs are the same. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, for me, it, because it was limited in how much we could communicate in terms of we couldn't do it in person till today, I just made a decision quite early on to keep it simple so it would be, you could, we could come in and turn up on the day. And Peter just sort of sight reads the music amazingly. So I gave him the music, we've had a couple of Zooms where he's played it through and my anxieties were laid to rest, basically. I was the one panicking because I hadn't written for organ and you don't know when, you know, someone might say, this isn't how you do this. Um, but we got there, didn't we? Yeah, but it was a great process to go through. Um, I think as well, the, the, some of the things that you don't realise as well that are, uh, are even more difficult when composing for organ as well, with uh, this organ for example being a mechanical action as well and having an almost very incessant rhythm in your piece as well, it actually works very well I think. Um, that's just like an added, added benefit as well of when I was playing it on my uh, home organ as well which is electric, I knew that it was going to sound much better actually on you know this the Union Chapel organ because of the mechanical nature so you feel a lot more connected to the piece and the instrument and you can almost accentuate the mm. like the incessant rhythm that is is going through the piece. Um, I've worked with a few composers before but not from like complete start start to finish. Um, I've you know sort of helped helped a few composers in the past where they go, oh I've I've got a piece that I've written like would you mind playing it or something but not um, from like end, end to end. No.
most weeks throughout the project over Zoom. Um, and that was quite challenging in itself because the organ's obviously quite a space involving instrument. It's you know they're tied to the building. And and to actually have a lot of the sound of what the organ is cut off and then distorted through Zoom yeah. was quite uh, definitely very challenging. For quite a while the track had a recording of the organ kind of glitching out on Zoom incorporated into the track. That, that <laughs> didn't make it in, um, in the end. But, uh, you know, in trying to use these kind of faults of this... Mm. Oh, and, and that's the other thing, the, the changing of the pitch, the, uh, the fluctuating pitch with the temperature um, is kind of something that led to the uh, the undulating and moving tape part, so that it didn't have to tie up exactly pitch wise. Uh, of course, then it actually did, and I had to just like you know tune it, tune it.
Okay, so I'm sort of halfway through uh, writing something at the moment that's very electronics heavy, in fact, that, uh, for an installation up in my hometown of Bedford, um, based around airships. And it's, it's a collaborative project with, uh, with some visual artists and things. But so I was thinking about the... Um, I've thought a lot about kind of hydrogen and the physicality of airships and things, and so a lot of the material um, for this piece I kind of extracted some ideas that I've been working on electronically um, for this. So it was, uh, there's a, a spectral analysis of hydrogen um, that I sonified into a chord that is then kind of randomly scaled and things quite a lot within it. Um, and then I was playing around with, with ordering of that and then kind of ate into it with the idea. So the airship that we're looking at is the R101 and just those digits 101 um, as a sort of a, an on, off, on kind of thing, I then sort of used that to kind of cut into the material that I'd made. Um, that's kind of, yeah. And then I wa also I wanted the idea of, of that 101 to be throughout the structure of the piece as well, so that you've got kind of returns to ideas. Um, especially since the material's quite, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, kind of, uh, quite all over the place on the organ. I think that whole idea of return seemed quite useful to me as well to ground an audience. I don't know. Does that make sense? Good. I mean, I guess one, one thing that you have when you are sending each other clips is the luxury of putting time where you want it under the microscope and stuff. So if I send you a, a video of playing with some half stops from my organ back in Cambridge or whatever and you can kind of listen to it in a way however many times you want mm -hmm. so hopefully that was helpful and um, actually especially when you're dealing with either a type of music as a player maybe that's a composer specific voice that you haven't worked with before or uh, working with a different instrument as a composer you kind of have the luxury of your giving yourself the time to get used to that process um, which has its own its own uh, sort of Pleasing, you can do it at your own pace in a way, uh, but you do lose the immediacy of being in the room with someone. So I guess that's the, that's the trade-off. But it's certainly interesting, and no reason why one can't combine both. And even when you can be in the room, keep keep the cameras on, keep uh, keeping a record of everything, so you can then go back. I, you know, actually just being able to just review things. I think is something that I've taken away from it's been quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, for me, like the organ is, I've, I haven't before at all so it was quite a daunting pros prospect anyway um, and then not being able to come down and, and see it was was quite scary and actually the first couple of days of thinking about this project I, I spent quite a long time kind of looking at diagrams of the organ and photographs on the net and things and trying to understand the physicality of it um, and not really feeling like I was getting there so having those videos for me was, was really helpful uh, really helpful um, and actually in the end uh, being able to just put a bit of trust in Luke to help me to think about the voicings and things because, yeah, it, that, that felt like something I wasn't going to be able to get to grips with without being able to sort of come down and have a play around. Um, but you're very well set up where you are, actually, so it was <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, we have so. AB stuff. I mean, the other thing that's fascinating, I think, with any school for organ is, is that there is maybe an element of, of, of performer agency in terms of what sounds you use and, and stuff built into a score, certainly if you're ever you know, putting a score up that you might not be collaborating with someone, they might let you pick it up. And so it, it's been an interesting exercise in where that balance of trust lies and how much information does go in the score. And actually I think we, in a way we've just done another process of it now, you then workshop it in person and, and you've got to decide, well how specific does your score want to become based on a few decisions we've just made? Or do you want to leave, do you actually not want to put much of what we just decided in terms of registration Sort of choices in the school because then different organs might want to adapt. So we can, we can now have this conversation yeah, about yeah. what your school now wants to look like for, for the future. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. No. So yeah, it's, it's it's been really interesting. I think I think one of the biggest challenges for me was just uh, working at home. With, uh, I have a, I have a young family and things, um, and uh, in the end, just having to embrace I'm going to be working very late at night <laughs> on this because it's not going to work otherwise. <laughs> Um, that's that's been fine, um, and I think that the I don't know I, I Sibelius seemed to deal quite well I thought with the organ in a way that it wouldn't necessarily suit a lot of um, uh, 
acoustic instruments. So it, it didn't feel the sounds. Yeah. yeah, it didn't feel too alien then coming down here. Um, yeah, but no, uh, yeah. But no, but yeah.
this is actually our creation. I wouldn't say it's an, just my creation. Uh, it's it was completely improvised. We've been practicing in Leeds. Um, yeah, rehearsing in the church. We tried to do a composition at first, but then yeah. we preferred just being completely free. Um, and it's also kind of the first time I do this kind of thing, where it's like I've always, I've often used a little bit of improvisation, but uh, this is the first time I do an actual completely free improv gig. So. Yeah, we kind of, um, when Tara came up to visit, we did, we tried out a few kind of ideas that sh she'd had, um, and then we were kind of making it into a structure and then decided that it just felt a bit forced, so um, we were like, <laughs> let's just turn up on the day and see what happens, um, and maybe use the ideas that we worked on, and, which yeah. we did actually a bit. We did, yeah. yeah kind of variations of yeah. things. Um, but, yeah, no, it was really fun. Yeah, we tried to work on, uh, like, uh, using different, using minimal notes and different sounds. Um, yeah. yeah, and different kind of, um, tried, like, the way, so I pulled out with the stops and things. Um, which actually worked really well in this one because um, you kind of were making it, it's that, for me it's out of it like the wind and kind of going on the theme of you being cold. Um, so I was kind of like, kind of the wailing wind yeah. with, the, with the stops, which was cool. Um, but yeah, <laughs> didn't include the frogs this time. <laughs> <laughs>